In 2008, for the first time in American electoral history, young African Americans voted in higher proportions than their white counterparts. Black women had the highest turnout of any group. And in 2012, the trend continued. Black voter turnout exceeded that of white Americans 66% to 64%. All politicians attempt to speak to voters in terms that will energize and mobilize, convey a sense of shared perspective, and show those voters how much they understand and care. In the case of politicians talking to African-American audiences, the effect can be rhetorically fascinating. Here's a sampling of some of my most memorable moments. There was Vice President Joe Biden speaking to the NAACP conference in 2012. And I went through the battle with Mouse. Mouse, are you out there? Hey, Mouse, how you doing, man? <laughs> Some yeah. mouse yeah. or former governor yeah. Mitt Romney campaigning in Florida in 2008 at the staging area for a local Martin Luther King Day parade. Who let the dogs out? Who let them dogs out? <laughs> or Hillary Clinton speaking at the First Baptist Church in oh. Selma, Alabama in 2007 for a commemoration of Bloody Sunday, especially when she quoted the gospel singer Reverend James Cleveland. Feel no ways tired. I come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me that the road would be easy. I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. Go ahead. Go ahead. <gasps> hey, that's a second time. <laughs> it's getting crazy at the table. Even black politicians do it. Even President Obama, like when he did this memorable moment in April of 2008, talking about attacks from the Hillary Clinton uh, uh, moment uh, at the debate. When you're running for the presidency, uh, then you've got to expect it. Uh, and, you know, you've just got to kind of let it. You know. What you gotta do. Do y'all remember that, right? A candidate for the presidency, right? So, for, for, for your viewers who don't, I can't even get through it. For the viewers who don't know, that was Mr. Obama channeling his inner Jay-Z. And some of those instances are code switching. And of course, some of them are more authentic than others. But there's another way to try to connect with black audiences. Talk in your regular old white man voice from Kentucky, but talk about policies that you believe will resonate with African Americans. Senator Rand Paul visited the National Urban League Conference this week to tout his efforts to lessen the burden of incarceration, especially on men of color. He did not try to imitate African-American vernacular English, but he did want the audience to know that he knows their stories. Rand Paul. But we must realize that race still plays a role in the enforcement of the law. Just ask Relik, Daquan, and Juan Taj. They were just standing on a street corner up in the Northeast when a policeman arrived on the scene and told him to move on or be arrested. What was their crime? Some have written and said, well, maybe their crime was waiting while being black. With me is MSNBC political analyst Michael Eric Dyson. Sure. <laughs> Elon James White. <laughs> this week, we were in so much trouble. This week in blackness, Paul Freimer, the, he's playing the normal guy. In the <laughs> Associate professor in the Department of Politics at Princeton University and Brittany Cooper, assistant professor at Rutgers. So let me, let me back up here because we wanted to have a little bit of fun with all the candidates, Democrats and Republican, black and white, sort of performing blackness. But in the case of Rand Paul, he wasn't performing a code switching, but he was doing something interesting as a libertarian Republican going, talking to the NAACP about a substantive policy issue. What do you make of that? No, that's right. I mean, I think it's awkward and it's cringeworthy. Um, at the same time, it's remarkable for how rare it is. Mm -hmm. um, most candidates just don't talk about race at all. Um, in part, it's because they get they're afraid of doing so. Very yes. few candidates, Obama, obviously, maybe Bill Clinton, uh, are more comfortable speaking before diverse audiences. Many are not. And so, you know, we need to encourage, in some level, this kind of conversation because it's so rare. Uh, the fact that, that Rand Paul talked about criminalization, mm -hmm. sentencing, um, surveillance, these are topics, again, that not just Republicans won't talk about, but Democrats won't talk mm -hmm. about. Uh, and what, what he will do is he's, if he keeps talking about it, is he's going to force people to talk about it with him. Mm -hmm. And what he might even do as well um, is make it safe or make Democrats feel safe to talk about it. All right, so, so this is interesting to me, in part 
because I think it's it is worth remembering that the moment that is the Obama moment has has led to enormous majorities of African Americans voting for the Democratic Party for the African American candidate for the support of this of this president. But that just prior to this, George W. Bush had won nine percent uh, of the African American vote, and and, and then in, in 2004 had won 11 percent right. of the African American vote. And I want to go back even a little bit further, Michael. I want to listen to Jack Kemp talking about wanting 50 percent of the black vote. Let's yeah. take a listen. We are the party of Lincoln, and we must be an inclusionary party. I'd like to see an America where half of all black Americans are voting Democrat, but the other half are voting Republican. I mean, I bet he would, because if half of black folks voted Republican, there'd never be another Democratic national office holder, right? Right, right. But is that, is that something to even... Uh, imagine as, as a worthy goal here this idea of of, of making the African-American vote a more swing vote. Well, look, first of all, Jack Kemp was a kind of Republican that we could use more of, and I yeah. think African-American people resonated with him. Uh, but aspirational politics are important, and I think that uh, Professor Primer was exactly right, that Rand Paul, cringeworthy notwithstanding, yep. did something that even some Democrats can do. we got to underscore mm -hmm. what he said. Talked about race and policy. Don't just show up and be black and then resonate emotionally with me. Mm -hmm. Speak about public policy that have the impact on my life. So in a way, Rand Paul did something that Barack Obama hasn't felt free enough to do, to speak directly to his experience as a black man being harassed by the police and do it within the context of policy and what he will promise to well, do. Well, I would suggest that, that, that I actually think the president did it more powerfully than any public figure I've ever yes, seen when he right. did his Trayvon Martin moment. Of so course, I think, of course. I think, I think he's had his moments. Policy. Right, but, but, but it is... There is something about watching a Republican do it, and again, he wasn't, I'm sorry, he wasn't talking to NAACP, he was talking to the Urban League, right. but seeing a, a, a Republican who's a credible candidate for the 2016 GOP nomination, like, I'm kind of into it, not because I think we should all be voting for the Republicans, but... I like this idea of forcing the conversation. Well, the thing is, Rand is getting better. So last year, he tried this at Howard, and he <laughs> bombed out. He uh, went to Howard and told the people about their own history. That's right. And got it wrong. That's yes. Right. You know, my alma mater represented very well and, and handled that. Um, so I think he's getting more savvy and recognizing that we don't need a history le lesson. We need issues. So what mm. strikes me is that, um, that one segment of the Republican Party might be trying to cultivate a certain kind of African-American voter. They might not swing him in 2016, or swing him or her in 2016, but a voter who is socially conservative but still has some level of racial analysis. So a person who says, I don't like abortion, I'm a fiscal conservative, but like mass incarceration, I recognize, does hinder communities, right? So, uh, you know, in Connecticut this week, we, we saw the firing of an African-American woman who was a consultant uh, in the gubernatorial race there, uh, in the lieutenant governor's race, because she used the words white privilege. Mm. So on the local level, um, there's still a resistance, but you do have folks coming up in the GOP who are trying to push some level of a racial analysis. Yeah. Okay, and maybe maybe I'm maybe I'm the uh, the bad guy here. One, I don't give Rand Paul that much credit for this because mm -hmm. one, Republicans are scared as all get out because they realize they're not going to keep winning. They know that the browning of America is coming, and so you can keep doing what the Republicans have been doing for a while, and you can lose. So Rand Paul actually understands that particular part. That on this part, uh, libertarians have been better than uh, conservatives in general. But this, what, what he's doing right now, one, he's learning, as uh, uh, Dr. Cooper said, that uh, the, how to speak to people, and at the same time, he knows that the writing is on the wall. They can keep trying this. If they don't speak to us, eventually, at this point, we've seen we're like, we're Specifically, black women were the were the reason why people have won. So you can keep not talking to us and fail, or you can learn about our issues, and then maybe we can have a conversation. Or you can become a tea party. But look, here's another alternative: you can become a tea party and get more deeply entrenched, and they've had some marginal success. So the point is, I give him credit because at least having seen the hieroglyphics of race inscribed on the wall, he's responding in a, an attempt to be more progressive and to address the public policy consequences. That's what I meant. I know Obama's okay. been brilliant about addressing. Yep. It. I meant in terms of public. Policy. So when we come back, we'll talk more.